Hello, everybody. My name is Kyle Posey. I am joined by Dr. Dugas. Dr. Dugas, please introduce yourself so people know who the heck you are. Uh, this is Jeff Dugas. I'm an orthopedic surgeon uh, specializing in sports medicine, and uh, my practice is in Birmingham, Alabama at the Andrews Sports Medicine Orthopedic Center, where I've been practicing for the last uh, 23 years. You said that you spent some time in the Bay Area um, because of the wine. Yes, I have. your favorite type of wine? I, I feel like I have. I'm a, I'm a red, I'm a Napa Valley cab, you know, blend, Pinot. Um, I drink a little bit of white wine, but I'm a fan of the uh, of the Napa stuff. I really do think it's as good as any anywhere, and uh, big fan. I, I don't think you can go wrong with cabs. So got good. No, nope, can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. Okay, so let's kind of give in, get into it. And for those that don't know your background, you did Nick Mullins UCL repair. That's accurate, correct? That is accurate. So, how do people approach you? How does this come about? Well, Nick's situation was very different. I've known Nick since he was in high school, and um, he went to high school here in Birmingham, and I I was the team doc for his high school, and so I've I've known Nick and his family for, gosh, you know, fifteen years. Um, and so Nick, you know, being from this area, he when he got injured, he sought our opinion. He, he did, and his agent, as all agents do, they they got a number of opinions. Um, Nick made the decision to, to do it here with myself and Dr. Andrews and rehabbed here with Kevin Wilk, who I will say the rehab part of this is, uh, is as important, sometimes more important than the surgery part. But, um, so Nick, Nick was a little bit different cause he was from here. Yeah. And we're going to get into, um, a lot of the rehab process. Cause I feel like that's what everybody really wants to know about. So yeah. just speaking about Nick himself. With these UCL repairs, and I, and I know you can't speak specifically to Brock, but it, it's clearly a case by case basis, right? Like not all of these are created equally. That's correct, and that's very true for all ligament injuries and all injuries in general, you know. And you can't you can't cookie cutter these things, and and I think it's also important to treat the athlete, not the image. And so there's you know there's there's grades of these things, there's spectrum of these things, and and. You can look at the surgery and say, yeah, we have to fix this ACL or this UCL or whatever. And that may be the surgical procedure, but that doesn't do justice to the amount of injury that took place, the amount of energy that went into that joint and, and what else could be injured. What other side injuries are there? What other a la carte things are there? So when you're advising like a patient, I think you're, you're, yeah, no, you're good. Okay. Yeah. So when you're advising a patient who, like in Brock's case, he's clearly wanted to do everything possible to avoid that reconstruction surgery. How difficult is delivering like the hard truths? So I think it's important to give people perspective of what their injury is and talk to them about their situation, because their situation may be very different, even though they may play the same position as another athlete or be in the same age group or, you know, you don't know, you got to know where they are in their, in their contract status, where they are in their playing status, what their goal, what their individual goals are, you know, is, is their goal to be doing this 10 years from now is their goal to be doing this one year from now and, and everything in between. And, and I think in sports medicine, our, our job is to, match the urgency and the goal of the patient it's not for me to say you have this injury and dogmatically say this is what you should do with it because this is what the book says that's the nature of sports medicine is the book is the patient and whether they wear a number on their back or not you have to adjust to what that person wants and sometimes you got to talk them through what's immediately in front of them versus what the long-term play is based on these things and what the options are for dealing with that. I know we're referencing Purdy quite a bit here, and he was dealing with swelling like five weeks after the NFC Championship. Was that a sign, like for anybody, I guess, that his injury was worse than the initial diagnosis? And I guess in that situation, is there anyone else, uh, anything else that you can do other than just waiting with rest and hoping that swelling subsides? And I can't I can't speak to the specifics of, of Brock's injury. You know, I think that when you're going to operate on someone, if the 
if the idea is you're going to replace a piece of tissue, <clears throat> it probably doesn't matter too much what the original piece of tissue looks like it, if you're replacing it. If it's shredded, if it's you know swollen, it doesn't really matter if you're replacing it. If you think that it's possible that you're going to repair a piece of tissue rather than replace it, it very much matters what the quality of that tissue is because you want it to be as healthy and strong as it can be when you repair it. And and this may be a broader answer. You don't want to operate on a limb with a lot of swelling in it where the motion is limited and the, there's enough pain. You, you may be making the rehab process more difficult. So we tend to wait, and this is true for all joints, ACLs, UCLs, shoulders, you know, ankles, especially hands and wrists. If there's a lot of swelling, you, you got to put that off and let that swelling calm down. You're going to take some risks with skin, with infection, with loss of motion, with pain and stiffness. And so, you know, even though you're, you're you want to get going because there's a timeline and, and there are people are various people are pushing to get this thing going, you always have to do what's best for the patient. And I, I have not spoken to Keith since the surgery. Meister, that is. But Keith is an elite elbow surgeon. He's one of the best in the country. And if he made the decision that this needed to wait a little bit, it was probably for a really good reason. And and I know that Keith is is very capable of deciding that. So I, I know that it had to be for the right reasons. He wouldn't have made that decision otherwise. Yeah. Speaking of some of those issues that could come, for example, like if you were to have that surgery with swelling. You talked about some of the skin infections and whatnot. Um, could it, does that make it maybe a better chance of you re-injuring yourself or like, what are some of those issues? Well, I'll give you an example. In the knee, we see people that have injuries doing all kinds of things, playing football, skiing, whatever you tear your ACL. And along with that, you might have a little minor MCL injury and a little meniscus injury, a little cartilage injury. And, you know, with those things, sometimes the knee doesn't want to move very well. You don't want to walk on it. They're real painful, real stiff and hard to bend. And if you go and operate on that knee, as opposed to the ACL that has, they tore their ACL, but they've got great movement, a little bit of swelling. They can put weight on it. They can walk on it. Hardly can, they, they have a hard time believing they tore their ACL. You're going to do the same operation on both of those knees. But the knee that bends well, walk on it, that's a calm knee. That, that's a knee that's ready for surgery because your surgery is perceived by the body as an injury. So you're, you're going to go operate on that knee and it's ready for it. You operate on that blown up knee, that, that really angry knee, you, you may be setting them back further than you're setting them forward. And yeah, you may have fixed the problem, but you may have created a longer recovery path for that person by doing it quickly. I tell people sometimes six weeks of waiting will save you three or four months of rehab. So even though it sounds like backwards, we're going to wait a little bit. And you're going to get better quicker. Sometimes if you're aggressive and you go operate too soon, you can you can create a longer path to recovery and just by the timing of the surgery. So, um, again, that's a decision I'm sure Keith was very comfortable making, and I have no doubt he made the right decision. Yeah, it sounds like that's exactly what happened here with waiting for the swelling to subside. And it on the outside, it seems like, like what's going on? How come he hasn't had surgery yet? But we don't know. Right. Like we have word. Right. Yeah. And and I think that that's it's it's not easy from from our perspective because you know, people are anxious. The players, you know, they want to get going. Look, everybody wants to be ready tomorrow. He's a he's a heck of an athlete. He's got a great opportunity to lead a great team. San Francisco's got a great team. They should be a contender next year. He wants to be part of that. He's a competitor. He's a fierce competitor, and he's a hell of an athlete. But ultimately, we have to be objective enough to say, look, we, we can. it's not the matter that we can't do the surgery tomorrow. We may be putting you on a path of prolonging your recovery and, and, and risking you not getting back to where you want to be if we, if we push the agenda. And, and, and quite honestly, if I was giving Brock advice about that, my advice would be don't prioritize game one. You know, prioritize the season, prioritize your career. Game one, 
San Francisco could lose the game one, and they're not going to have any troubles making the playoffs and playing their best football at the end of the season. So don't don't prioritize game one. Don't prioritize the preseason games. This is a you got to prioritize the long term here with this, not the short term. And and um, and I know Keith would feel the same way about that. Yeah, and I mean, in Brock's case, and uh, just like Nick Mullins, like these guys are young. He Brock just turned twenty three, so when you're thinking about big picture. He's probably yep. you know have to be ready for week one. Uh, this might be my last opportunity. So how difficult yep. is that in the sense? And I mean, I'm I imagine you're still giving the same information, but I'm just navigating through what the big picture is as opposed to I need this now and I have to have it or else I might not get another chance. Yeah, I think that the people around Brock were probably giving him really good advice about seeing this as a long-term play, not a short-term play. And, you know, the timing of the surgery being, whether it's this week or two weeks from now, that's less important than the long-term view of this. And I have no doubt that they were all giving him that same advice. What's the difference between that reconstruction surgery and a Tommy John surgery, for example? So the, the reconstruction and Tommy John are synonymous. That's Tommy John was obviously the original pitcher for the Dodgers that Frank Job did in 1974 or 78. I forget which. I think it was 74. And and the procedure got named after, after Tommy John. It's where you take a tendon and you basically create a new ligament. So you're drilling tunnels in the bones and you're weaving a tendon graft into those tunnels to create a new ligament. That's very you know, different than the repair with the internal brace. So back in the day when Frank Job and Jim Andrews, who were probably the, and Lou Yoakum, they were the three giants of elbow surgery. Dave Alchek came along and added the docking technique. And that's actually where I learned to do these operations because I was a resident in New York with Dave Alchek. But those four guys probably, you know, Frank Job obviously pioneered it. Andrews was next. Yoakum was next. And I'll check those. Those are kind of the four horsemen of UCL Tommy John surgery. Back in the day when this thing started, they didn't have super sutures and collagen dip this and that and suture anchors that would hold up to pulling a you know small car and you know there there's they didn't have the technology nor the forty years fifty years worth of experience that we now have on the rehab side and the surgical side and and all the gazillions of these that have been done they didn't have the benefit of that so for 30 years there was one answer because they all tried doing repairs back to bone and none of them worked they didn't work very well so this idea of repair really frank job and jim andrews when they published their original results back in the 80s and 90s or 90s and early 2000s rather they had repairs in those groups of patients that failed relative to the reconstructions. And so rightfully, these giants of history that did these things and, and did them better than anybody said repair was a bad idea because their results were terrible. Something like 30 percent of pros got back to pitching and stuff like that. So they panned it. They, they said, this, this doesn't work. We should do reconstructions. And they were right. Well, fast forward 20 years. Now we got better technology, a lot better understanding. We got better stuff. We got more equipment, better anchors, better sutures, collagen coating. We got all these different things. And so we circled back to this and started doing it about 10 years ago. We did some basic science studies and we looked at pullout strength and we looked at time zero fixation and all these things. We compared it to Tommy John surgery because that was the gold standard and still is. The problem for Tommy John surgery is that graft, that tendon, you put in there that has to heal and it has to become ligament like tissue it has to undergo a change in the body so that process of ligamentization that that's a substitution process where the body kind of grows into that graft and becomes ligament like that process takes 12 months the repair with the internal brace you're taking a ligament that's detached and you're getting it to heal back to where it came from it doesn't have to undergo any change. It just has to stick back to where it came from. And we repair every other ligament in the body. So our thought was, why not this one now that we've got all this new stuff? And so we 
started doing this, the first one I did was in August of 2013. And in the first four that I did, I did two baseball players, a football quarterback, high school kid, and a wrestler. And I didn't do another one for six years because I wanted to make sure it worked and before I was going to do a bunch of these. And, and they all did well, and they all got back in, in a shorter period of time, basically half or less of the time of recovery of the full Tommy John. So the difference between the two is you're repairing a piece of tissue back to where it came from versus asking another piece of tissue to become the torn piece of tissue. And so one of them has to undergo a change in the body, a biologic change from what you put in there to what it's going to become. And the other one just has to stick and heal. And so in, in both cases, the, the requirements for those are very different in our eyes and all the eyes of the people who do these things. If you have good tissue to repair and it's torn off the bone, you can repair it. If it's crud, if it's just this gelatinous crud, if it's beat up and shredded and bad tissue or there's missing tissue or whatever, you can't repair that. You got to augment that with, with tissue. You need a graft. And so I think after 10 years, we've all gotten kind of comfortable with making those decisions and, and, and going forward with them. And Keith has done as much as anybody in that world. He's one of the gifted, you know, elbow surgeons. So he's very adept at making that decision. Knowing that these repairs are only a decade old, I said, I should say young. I imagine if I were to pull the majority of laymen like myself, like you would think they'd be around for 50 years, right? And obviously technology has came a long way, but just knowing that uh, they're this relatively new is is kind of insane to think about. It is. And, um, you know, people ask all the time, is, is this going to last? Well, I mean, your ligament was built to last. It was designed that way. You know, the, when you were born, it was designed to last you a lifetime. And it didn't because of an injury you had. But if the tissue is still good, now you've got what was designed to last a lifetime plus the tape. So you've got an augmented situation from where you started. We don't really see these things deteriorate over time. We haven't seen that. That's important. So the failure rate is not accelerating at 10 years. It's not. It's, it's the same. And so that that tells us that the answer to that question is no, it, it's not going to, just because it's only been 10 years relative to 50, it, it's not going to deteriorate over time. Neither is reconstruction going to deteriorate over time. So thankfully, um, Brock avoided the dreaded reconstruction surgery. So there have been reports that, you know, he'd begin to throw in three months. How accurate is that? And, and do you know what that, are you able to like walk us through what that three month process would look like? I can't speak to that. Um, there's a lot of questions in the question you just asked. Yeah. Um, and I don't have the benefit of knowing what the tissue looked like, how confident the physician, Dr. Meister, is with letting him throw, what the throwing program he'll be on in terms of returning to throw. Um, I, I don't have the benefit of, of knowing that. Um, I, I can tell you that the order of operations that after virtually any operation, be it UCL, ACL, rotator cuff, the first priority is healing. And typically in that first six to eight week period, we're using some form of protection, brace, splint, whatever it is. And we're, we're not really immobilizing them. We're, we're cautiously moving them with protection. And the idea is to get range of motion back while it heals without putting any stress on the repair. So notice nowhere in there do we talk about strength. Right. The priority in the first part of this is healing and range of motion. Then we move into the next phase and we work on strength, not just muscle strength, but the strength of the repaired tissue. So they'll start doing things called plyometric drills, where they're using, you know, small weighted balls or little weights and things to build, to kind of push the tissue that's healed, that new tissue in there to try to push it a little bit without pushing it to fail. And, and that's usually somewhere in that time frame is when we start letting them do other body things like jogging or leg work or, you know, whatever. 
And that's usually in the middle section of the recovery. And then we get to more the functional part of the recovery where he'll start working on more sports specific type of activities. Is there a time for him that, that that part? The it's sports. different. It's different for everybody. I, I couldn't speak to Kyle's or to, uh, to, um, I couldn't speak to, uh, to his, but, um, you know, I, to Brock's rather, I couldn't speak to Brock's, but I, you know, I think it's highly dependent on, on the surgeon and their preference and, you know, discussions with the patient and what they, what they see, what they feel, the therapists that are working with them. I think it's a broad range, you know, to me, it could be anything from, you know, I don't know. I would hesitate to even say, I, I think it's, I think it's a broad range. It'd be up to the surgeon. Yeah. I don't want to press you for an answer, especially if you're not comfortable or, you know, speaking on that. So, I mean, some of the, some of the questions that I do have come off as somewhat specific, for example, um, we're talking about the ramp up period, which that, and I'm using the terms that I've been reading about and familiar with. So like the ramp sure. up period happens from three to six. And from an outsider's perspective, that's like, you would think there is going to be inevitable soreness. So, I mean, I know you can't speak on what those three months would entail, but um, is it as simple as the athlete getting back to normal in that? And then you kind of spoke about that with the sports activities. Well, I'll tell you how I did it with Nick and, and how I've done it with other quarterbacks. You know, take a season. Let's say we're in season. In season looks like you play a game on a day. And for the NFL, let's just take Sunday as the day. You play on Sunday. You're throwing 40 balls at full speed, various distances, multiple parts of the field, different depths. You're handing the ball off. You're getting tackled. You're landing on it. You're running, you're fatigued, you're playing for three hours. Monday, you're not doing anything physically. You're, you're taking the day off. You might do a little light jog, but you're probably in the training room or you're sitting at home, you're, you're rehabbing. Tuesday, you're going to do a little bit. You're going to throw a little bit. Wednesday is going to probably be your biggest day of throwing. Um, and you're going to be in shells, you know, helmets and shoulder pads. You're probably not getting crushed. They're, they're green jersey, these guys. So he's not landing on it. Thursday, he'll probably throw a little bit. Friday, he's going to probably travel. Saturday, they'll do walk through. Sunday, they play again, right? That's kind of a normal cadence for an NFL quarterback. So in there, there's three days in a row where he's throwing, you know, some. So I think before he can get back to playing an NFL season, he's got to go through maybe a week or two, maybe more than that, of that kind of cadence, throwing balls anywhere from five yards to 50 yards, 60 yards, throwing velocity, throwing touch passes, throwing spot passes, throwing out patterns, throwing, you know, velocity over the middle. You know, so he's got to throw in different angles. He's got to throw in different situations, moving right, moving left. So he's got to be able to throw from different types of positions. And to get to that point where he can do a simulated week, he's got to have done all that. So I think with Nick, and, and Nick's was a little different because we did his early and in, in we did his before the season ended. Um, I think we did his in uh, December. But, you know, we we really pushed him to be feeling comfortable with range of motion and all that. We delayed his throwing. We weren't on a tight timeline. Um, we wanted to make sure he felt good, had his body ready to throw, had his shoulder ready to throw. And that's the other part of this rehab wise. You can't just start throwing when the elbow's ready. You got to have the whole body ready. So, um, you know, I, I think the range is pretty broad for, for Brock's situation. And I would hesitate to give a, timeline but there, there's a lot you got to get to it's not right. just hey when can he throw it's when can he throw from multiple angles running different directions at different depths and velocity and when's his accuracy back and you know how much volume does it take to get that back and that's going to be highly variable one athlete to the next so nick i want to say nick's was early december if i'm uh if I'm remembering, I think it was late December. Was it? I think we did his on. I think it was actually New Year's Eve. Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying to think. 
he was ready for training camp, right? He was. I'm just trying. He to was keep... ready in August. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and he had moved. To him. He was ready. Yeah. So, I mean, all eyes are on what happens over these next six months. Is there anything 49ers fans should be on the lookout at? Wise as far as news standpoints, whether that's, you know, red flags, whether that's, you know, optimistic outlooks, um, should we, we be weary of anything? And it, I mean, who knows what type of information we're going to get? Who knows what type of information we can trust, which is, you know, makes it even more difficult. Um, <laughs> what do you think about that? All I can tell you is from my, from my discussions with Brock, Brock, Brock is a competitor, and Brock wants to play quarterback for the 49ers. Um, and he's committed to that. And, um, and, and I think this whole thing is set up for success. I think the question is not if. The question is when. And that's a question we can't answer right now. And, and I think that Brock obviously has the skill set. He's got the drive. He's got the personality, the toughness, the tenacity, the – athleticism, the football brain, the he's got the skills. The, the ability to throw a football is going to come back. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And so I think if I'm giving 49ers fans a, you know, a look at the future, I would say I'm not too worried about Brock if he comes back. I'm worried. The question is when. And that's a much better place to look at it from rather than if. And so I'm not too worried about if I'm worried about, you know, the question is when, and it doesn't really matter at this point. He's going to get back. I think that's honestly what people want to know, like what people and probably want to hear. And I know that you're not just saying that, but there's always from the outside. Again, we, we don't know, we don't know anything. (laughs) And to think about, or to go based off of like, I know he didn't have the reconstruction surgery, but when you see these, these devastating elbow injuries, you always wonder, like, will he ever be able to have that same type of velocity, that same type of accuracy? Will he ever be able to, you mentioned, throw from different arm angles because that's what it takes to be a quarterback. So knowing that that's not going to be an issue, that, that is comforting. You know, we we didn't fix these things for a long time in quarterbacks. This is not a new injury. These have been going on for decades. And people have played without having it fixed. Uh, Josh Allen did that this year. He's had two injuries there. And – I mean, look how the Bills did. You know, the Bills had a great season. Josh Allen had a great season. Um, you know, there's plenty of quarterbacks that have had these injuries that that have managed to do them even without surgery. So I have no doubt that Brock will get back. He's a phenomenal athlete with incredible talent. He's got every resource around him to get back. Everybody's oars are rowing in the same direction. It's not like they're disparate interests here everybody has the same interest everybody's goals are aligned it's there's nothing competing in the other direction everything's growing in the same direction so he's got every resource and and support and and as i said i mean he is highly competitive and a tremendous athlete he will be fine and the question of when if i'm if i'm asking if i'm asking anything of of the fans don't get too mired in this game or that game he's a he's he's gonna be the quarterback for the 49ers at some point i feel confident of that and it doesn't really matter whether it's weak this or weak that that's i can't you can't worry about that right now do you can worry about that as we get closer to it but right now is not the time to worry about which week he's going to be back um he's a hell of a talent and san francisco's lucky to have him he's he's definitely got what it takes so i i he's not going to lose that yeah, I don't think we have anything to to offer other than that. That was great. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, is there anything that you want to plug? Is there anything that you uh, have working on or anything before we get out of here? I would just I would just say that I have. I think it's important to say in whatever piece you're giving or whatever this is going to be that that I have every confidence in Keith Meister. I can't say that enough, and I think it's important for me in my role in this to support that. Keith is one of the best in the business. That is no joke, no lie. He is as good as it gets. There's nobody, you know, there's there's a bunch of people that do these things and they're all really good at it. Keith is in that group. So he, he's going to be, I have every confidence in Keith's decision-making. He's elite at this. He, he does a great job. He's on top of it. He'll be watching his rehab very closely and monitoring that and talking to his therapist. And uh, 
I just want to make sure it, it, it goes on record how much I support Keith because I think he, he he's one of the best there is in this business. I imagine that'll be music to all of 49ers fans. Now, I appreciate you taking now, When you're ready to go off the record, I'll go off the record with you. <laughs> Let's uh we're gonna, we're gonna stop here right there. Uh, I appreciate you, there you go. taking the time and uh hopefully we won't be talking to you anytime soon because there will be no more <laughs> UCL injuries. <laughs>